City Lights on Location joins Jerry Lewis on location in Miami. The film is the king of comedy. Before I express my enthusiasm for you and the film, I'd like to thank you. And what I want to thank you for, I've never met you, not had an interview with you before, is just the reality for me of making my youth a more pleasant place. Because the memories of specific movies, I've talked about you so often behind your back mm. with people in the industry. You're the one, huh? Uh, one of. <laughs> one of. You know, talking to Shirley MacLaine about artists and models, talking to peep Susan Oliver, and saying things about what Jerry Lewis meant to those of us for whom Saturday afternoon at the Bijou was something that got you through Monday to Friday. Mm -hmm. And I thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. That, I love to hear that. I love that when people say, I've grown up with you. I really like that. It's true. It's nice. I it's mean, 48 films, 56 years, 51 of those years devoted to entertaining us. Yeah, I've been busier than hell, haven't I? You have, particularly <laughs> the last couple of years. Yeah, pretty much. When, when I said hello and told you that I was a Canadian, you told me something I did not know about you, and that was something called the Gaiety Theatre yeah, in Tor Toronto. Right. It was the only burlesque house in Toronto, and one of the better burlesque houses. There was the Palace Theatre in Buffalo, there was the Gaiety in Toronto, and you played the two weeks, if you were lucky, you played Buffalo first, then you played Toronto. Well, in Toronto, that was my first time in Canada. I was terribly shook at the thought of going from Buffalo to Canada when I realized I didn't have a passport. I mean, that's really naive, right? And I went through the process of finding out how I get across, and they said, you get on a bus, idiot, and you ride over there. But the Gaiety Theater was across the street from the Statler Hotel, and the Statler Hotel looked a little like Beirut does today. It was just one floor of four rooms, and I think I'm staying at the Statler until they walked me across the street and they said, do you think you're gonna pay $4 a week at a real Statler? Now the Statler is gone in Toronto, the Gaiety Theater is gone, and all of what I just told you, you could just wonder about. But check it and you'll see it's true. All right. And I made $110 a week. Canadian or US? Uh, I don't think I, oh, I think I was paid in Canadian. Yeah, I Even lost. Even then you lost money. I knew I got screwed going on that date. Listen, it could have been worse. Now it's 20 cents on the dollar. <laughs> you want, really? You want to go to Mexico and have some fun? <laughs> as long as it's not Tijuana. When, when you talk about the king of comedy and you say, you have said, I'd love to have you think it's great acting, but all I had to do was react to Robert De Niro's creation of Rupert Pupkin. Mm -hmm. When I sit there and have Laurence Olivier's biography open after having read yours, and Lord Olivier maintains that great acting is reacting, it's listening, can we qualify what seems to be your minimization of reacting and listening? If Lord Olivier said that, he probably knows what he's talking about, and if I said the other, I probably don't. I like what he said. <laughs> <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Okay. Gotcha. I, just, I just think that so many extraordinary things, I know so many extraordinary things were going on on the set with you, Martin Scorsese, Robert De Niro, and company. I mean, you, were, you went off for two days to Winston-Salem, North Carolina to play golf, and while you were gone, Robert De Niro said, I want to watch exactly like Jerry's. No, he wanted mine. He wanted your own watch? Yes. Did you give it to him? Yeah, he would not do the scene unless he was wearing my watch. And we had to send to New York, have my driver drive it out in a limo from New York to the location, which was a couple hours away. And until I got security to open the suite at the hotel, calling from North Carolina, that watch got to Bobby around 4 o'clock that afternoon. The scene was only a two-line scene in the whole picture. He was wearing a jacket and a shirt, but he wanted to wear that watch, which helped him he was supposed to emulate me, the character in the film. That helped him. Now, you want to call that eccentric, cuckoo nuts, bonkers? I say that's the stuff that gets Raging Bull on the screen. And no one will ever dispute it with an artist like Bobby. I won't. If I heard the story, 
I would say, well, that's nuts. Come on, I've directed actors before, and I've seen how they work, and so on. When I watch this whole process, I repeat whatever Bobby De Niro does to get that kind of performance on the screen. Don't tell me he's bonkers. He knows what he's doing. As an artist who, who can not only be referred to as the total filmmaker, but published a volume as the total filmmaker and can lecture at universities the way you do, you are the disciplinarian. You are on the set. When you find yourself on a set with Martin Scorsese and there seems to be ostensibly a lack of discipline because it's 8 o'clock in the morning and Jerry's not only on time, he's early uh -huh. and the crew is chuckling. Because they didn't, Marty didn't show up until 1.30 or 2 o'clock that afternoon. It was mind-boggling the first few days. I never, I've, I've just had never seen uh, that kind of, of sloppy discipline. It wasn't sloppy at all. It was all by design. And I think Bobby De Niro's performance is on that screen again. When I'm aware that Martin Scorsese can say, I was a Jerry Lewis fan before this began, Jerry Lewis was helpful not only as an actor, he was helpful as the total filmmaker. When you turn to Robert De Niro and you say before a scene, your timing's too good. Right. Rupert Pupkin isn't that good. Right. And you teach Robert De Niro how to be less good? It was tough. It's tough to teach someone how to time poorly. But Bobby learns his craft and learns what he has to do. And in this case, he learned it just a hair too well. And he was just too slick. And then Marty came to me and asked me to help Bobby be less than slick. And that's tough. I would, I would assume that the slickness came from those days and weeks that Robert De Niro spent in a screening room studying clinically all of your films. When you could do a, a visual gag to Robert De Niro on the set, and he could name the movie, the scene that preceded it, mm -hmm. and what was about to happen, wasn't it just a little alarming to think, is this man going to do all 48 of my movies, including Smorgasbord and Slapstick, while I'm here? <laughs> it's a little alarming when you're looking at one of the greatest actors that ever lived, who could easily be referred to as the largest fan you have in the world. That's, that's, that's disarming and alarming and mind-boggling and, and very, very humbling. When your director, Martin Scorsese, sends you out onto the street in New York, and Jerry Lewis and Jerry Langford somehow cinematically become one. Mm -hmm. And we see this reaction. There's, there's an extraordinary sense of there's a movie happening within a movie and there's a man playing the most famous television person in the world and this famous man in the world walking down the street. And I had the feeling that Scorsese had sent you out on a a mission of cinema verite, oh, yeah. and Jerry Lewis was being challenged to get down that street while they were doing a tracking shot. Oh. Wasn't there an incident of a little old lady who came out and did what can only be described as a triple take, knowing it was Jerry Lewis, and finally an assistant director came out and got her out of the shot? Oh, yeah. Yeah, she walked about 40 feet with me. She just couldn't believe it. You are really... And I want her to know there's a truck right there with camera and crew, and I couldn't get it out. She's, I, I don't believe that you're, are you telling me that you're him and I'm walking? And she went some 40 feet with me, and we've got all that footage. And I had to keep going, because we had a second camera at the end of this setup, and I had to meet that. So I'm trying to get as far around as I can and shake her, hoping they're gonna zoom a little tighter to lose her. We have her, she's full in. She ain't in a movie, but she's in that piece. Then, of course, I'm walking down the street and all the construction workers are yelling, hey, Jerry, and it all works. We talked about, Marty and I talked about if there was gonna be so much street stuff in New York, let's call the character Jerry. Now, there's one marvelous moment in the film where I'm standing totally alone at 65th of Madison, and this lady walked up and she looked at me, and she's looking at the traffic lights, and she looked at me again, and looked at the traffic lights, and then she leaned forward and said, Jerry Lewis, son of a gun. If she'd have just said Jerry, son of a gun, we'd have had it, and we'd have kept it. But she put the name together, 
And I looked at her, I said, son of a bitch. <laughs> and we cut. It would have been super if she had just said Jerry. Every well, every time I got sorry. screwed up. Well, Jerry Langford is not based on any one individual. You did have what you described as a casual conversation mm -hmm. with Johnny Carson. There was one description where Jerry Langford might be a combination of Johnny Carson and Walter Cronkite, where his flippancy is never sacrificed for his trustworthiness and or dependability to his audience. When we sit there and we watch this and realize what really is happening in the world, how we see the underside of celebrity, what really happens with celebrity, being wheeled into surgery, being asked by Helen for your autograph. There's a sense of being so frightened the movie terrifies in one aspect. While you're being entertained and you're looking and listening and learning, you're frightened. It frightened me that way. Because it's real. It's real, it's honest, it's out there. You have to be aware of it. The word fanatic is a frightening word. Well, what's the first three letters? Fan. That's it. That's the name of the tune. Scratch a fan. Mm -hmm. When you were having one of the one of, the confrontation scenes with Robert De Niro. And in that unique imp improvisational way, racial slurs, epithets were being thrown at you. You were both building into the scene. Mm -hmm. You said it was frightening when you did it, but when you saw it on the screen, it was doubly frightening. Why doubly when you saw the result? Well, because I'm performing something I've never performed before in that, in that uh, intensity kind of a performance. Now to see the character, or to see myself, because I have no mask or no disguise that I'm used to seeing the silly Jerry hide behind, it was doubly frightening because I was watching myself play a real life moment in my life. The insipid idiocy of the fan as the fanatic, and watching myself portray myself, celebrity quote, end quote, being annoyed and, and literally harassed by that maniac. It's frightening. I've never been able to look from the outside in when I'm being harassed. And you're not interested in looking from the outside in when you're being loved, because you don't particularly care about seeing that. The joy of it happening is all you need. When your mother told you very early on that all your life you were going to have a love affair with humanity and she only hoped you never found it fickle, have you ever? On occasion, yes. Uh-huh. But it's okay. As long as there's 90 that hug you and 10 won't, the percentages will keep me going. When you talk about being resilient, never being happier in your life, mm -hmm. when all of us have picked up newspapers and read that you are with your friend, Dr. Michael DeBakey, that Denton Cooley's looking in, that you're fine. New life, new, new attitude toward a new life, mm -hmm. new marriage, and your father's advice about you're gonna love the racket kid because if you don't, it isn't gonna work. Right. I think that those two statements from your mother and father, what I'm asking is, what has been the secret of your resiliency? I really don't know. I think that I've been so afraid, this is just conjecture now, I think I've always, all my life, been so afraid of being a coward that I never was one. Whatever the cost? No matter what. And I do not think courage goes out of style. Can I resolve something? Because I'm sitting in front of the filmmaker who has been quoted on more than one occasion as having described American critics as whores. But at the same time... Some. Some. Right. You can come out and say about Pauline Kael, as good as it's ever going to be. About Bosley Crowther, not as articulate, but he loved the cinema and ripped my ass off every time I came out with a new movie. Right. Judith Christ cares a lot. 
Richard Schickel. Richard Brilliant. Schickel. But this, this doesn't come up a lot. I mean, most often one reads about you or hears that Jerry Lewis has again denounced critics as whores <laughs> or had a confrontation. Some of them. Some. I'm, right. I'm here to offer the quote on those you do respect. There are many that I respect. What would an Academy Award nomination for your performance in King of Comedy mean to you at this point? If indeed it would mean anything? Oh, indeed it would mean a great deal. Any man that tells you that an award given to you by your peers doesn't mean anything is a liar. I think that those that won't accept it because of a, a credibility factor or based on their own personal integrity is one issue. I allude to George Scott, his not choosing to accept that. I respect that while I am troubled that he didn't have that moment that he earned. Any man would be proud to be the recipient of a nomination like that. I don't particularly agree with the Academy. I've made that very clear. I think that there's a, a lot that needs to be done to make it perfect. But I would be very honored and very proud. And then I'll take my disputes with them to them directly another time, another day after I get the award. I'll be very humble and swell and I'll say such nice stuff. I'll give them all diabetes, I'll be so sweet. It's called blowing smoke. Once that's over and I got that sucker on my mantle, I'll tell them what I really think of them. <laughs> I just think it's important to remind myself in front of you that you are the man who, in your criticism of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, said, let's give the awards to the great contributors while they're alive. Let's recognize people's contributions while they're around to hear. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about what they've done with certain great people, it's, it's the people who have contributed to the world of comedy right. who are most often dismissed. But I have been accused of wanting the comedy category because I wanted an award. I don't belong in that category I'm talking about. And that's not false modesty. I'm talking about Charlie Chaplin and Stan Laurel. I'm talking about Harry Langdon and Larry Seaman and Ham Hamilton, the people that made the motion picture industry. It all started with those men. Don't wait till they die to acknowledge them. That's all it's ever been about. We don't have a category for the very reason that there is an academy. Comedy. Keystone Cop started it all. How do you dare not have a category for comedy when you've got one for the engineer that puts a bulb in the men's room. That troubles me, bothers me, it's wrong. What you're saying is that comedy is lowbrow and it cannot be acknowledged by those of us who are thespians. Oh really? <laughs> so it might be dangerous if I'm nominated. I might say all of this in the acceptance speech. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like Jerry Lankford? The character? Yes. Do you oh, like yes. that man? Yeah. I liked, I liked playing him. I didn't have to really dig too deeply to find out what he was all about because he was very close to what I am. So uh, uh, if there's any degree of narcissism in my being, I like the character. And he was real and honest and true. And there wasn't a hell of a lot you could do with him other than what was done because he was an interactor with Bobby. That was so... If they didn't work in concert, I felt both of them thinned out. Now I'm talking like a filmmaker. They did thin out when they were not in concert. But the whole picture is when they're together. King of Comedy is a fait accompli and it's available to moviegoers. While we wait for Slapstick, Kurt Vonnegut's Slapstick, mm -hmm. and your production of Smorgasbord, right. is there any concern that millions of people are going to go into the King of Comedy, see your creation of Jerry Langford, see the artist working in a way none of us were prepared for uh -huh. before we walked in, and then have to, in a sense, start a game saying, the Jerry you knew and loved before is back to thrill you again. <laughs> I haven't any concerns about that. No? No, not really. Because an actor must do what he does, and... Uh, Although I have for most of the better part of my life been very clear to an audience what will happen when they walk in the theater. This is just a departure and it should be only a minimal one for them. They should know that after this it's going to be okay to go again. Okay. If they don't, I'll take out ads. <laughs>
I've enjoyed being with you. Thank you, Brian. I enjoy it, too. What I told you earlier, I meant, and I'll say it publicly. Whenever I see your show at home, I enjoyed it. I had never met you, but you do, you do your homework, and you make everyone that you interview come off very well. Thank you. You're welcome. Very much. And if it doesn't happen with me, you'll get some letter. <laughs> I thank you again. Thanks, Brian. Pleasure.